says we got a couple, a couple questions. If the Zymol, the question is, will the Zymol be included in a maintenance kit? Um, I can't say never. Um, one of the things about the Zymol is because it is a high-end premium product, um, it, it has a premium price with it um, because it's, uh, it's an amazing product, but it's not, um, if you, for example, if you bought an old featherweight that had had a rough life and everything, uh, you need that tune-up kit for to put new feet on the bottom and oil it and get grease and everything going and a new drip pad mm -hmm. on the bottom. Uh, but it may not be one that you're necessarily concerned with putting a show car quality uh, wax finish on it. And so um, probably... Um, I don't know. We'll think about that, mm -hmm. but it, it just uh, it wouldn't be necessarily for everyone. Like the tune-up kit, uh, pretty much is relevant right. to, to everybody. So, yeah. Questions, April. Um, there was another question about. Uh, let me get there. Uh, how fast does the two two one run? Mine is like new, but it sews like a turtle. <laughs> okay. You want to address that? Um, I don't know how many, st the question is how fast is the 221? I don't know exactly how many stitches per inch it's supposed to. So um, I haven't ever seen that number out there. It may be out there as far as from the factory, how many stitches the featherweight's supposed to sew per inch or per minute, sorry. And which would also pertain to how long you had your stitch length set on would Right. would pertain to how fast it would move the fabric right. as well. But her question was, her sews like a turtle, mm -hmm. even though the machine is, is nice. Yeah, and there's a lot of things that can factor into why a featherweight's sewing slow. Um, the motors are old, and they may not be operating at 100%. Um, the belt may be too tight, so it's adding unnecessary resistance when the motor is spinning um, it could be too loose so that the belt's slipping and not um, staying in contact with the pulley or the hand wheel um, there could be a thread jam a thread caught behind the hook assembly behind the motor pulley behind the hand wheel yeah, there could be um, varnish in the machine it might need some triflow oil put in those oiling points to break down some of that varnish um, varnish is just old sewing machine oil that kind of gets that brownish sticky mm -hmm. look to it mm -hmm. over that time. slows the machine down it could be something in the gears um, there's quite a few things that can slow a machine down and I, I should I should clarify that often varnish comes from the wrong types of oil put on in the past like mm -hmm. three-in-one oil mm -hmm. and stuff like that right uh, that causes varnish mm -hmm. um, and then did you mention about a, a belt Mm -hmm. belt just being stiff. Uh, some of the previous reproduction belts were extremely stiff and you would put one of those belts on there and it could really slow the machine down. Right, right. And to isolate whether or not it's a motor type issue or a mechanical um, machine issue, then usually what we'll do is turn the hand wheel, see if the hand wheel is difficult to turn at all. If it is, then you know it's something more mechanical versus something electrical in the motor. If the machine turns fine, then you can take the belt off, see if the motor is spinning freely, um, see it, it might be binding a little bit, but there are a couple things that you can do to isolate whether or not it's the workings of the machine, the mechanical portion, or the electrical portion in the motor. Yeah, so that's uh, that would be Christian kind of ran down the the troubleshooting mm -hmm. list that we would that we would go through um, because if, if a machine is just sewing slowly you have no idea uh, just by looking or listening or anything mm -hmm. what what's causing that and so quite often uh, it does require that uh, that step-by-step -step process of, of trying to figure out what is what is causing that mm -hmm. um, but yeah that's that's a good question um, okay, uh, next question, April? Um, that a Pierce My Clear Coat is a 
um, is damaged. Is it what is it recommended to try the Zymol, or what should she do? I know you guys talked about that last week with David. That some we did talk about that last week. Um, the question is, or the problem is, the clear coat on um, a specific machine is looks like it's damaged. What can be done? Can we use Zymol? Yeah, and so uh, there's there's several options, and one of the hard things with with clear coat is there's kind of worn, and then there's damaged. Mm -hmm. Worn clear coat, uh, no big deal. You put Zymol on there, and uh, you've got a now a protected surface to keep it from getting worse. Uh, you've got this smooth surface for the fabric to slide on, uh, but years of wiping it down with the wrong type of um, cleaning agent or whatever can actually harm the clear coat and so we have seen where when you put the HD cleanse which is the first step you got to get everything clean so that the wax has something to adhere to mm -hmm. uh, you can put that HD cleanse on there and really it magnifies um, the basically what's been hidden mm -hmm. by you know sewing machine oil and things like that so I've, I've seen a few machines uh, come through where we put HD cleanse on there and it magnifies the true look of what's really going on with the clear coat and the damage there. And in those situations, uh, a lot of times the only thing you can do is put a little sewing machine oil on it and kind of, I don't know, for a lack of better terms, rehydrate uh, that, that clear coat that is there. Uh, I'm not a fan of wiping a sewing machine down with with oil as a as a standard practice, um, it, you can make it look shiny um, sometimes. Uh, but I often, you know, I say, you know, would you wipe? Would you take olive oil and wipe your kitchen counter down with it uh, to make it shiny? To make the marble shine, you wouldn't because that olive oil would just attract dust. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's a that's a good question, uh, and it does take a little bit of of trouble of troubleshooting so if you put the, the Zymol on there on that spot and you're not happy with how it looks uh, you can go back to wiping it down with with sewing machine oil um, yeah so. Okay, so somebody got a white machine and the thread stand doesn't fit in the top hole is there a difference on the white machines I did refer her to the thread stand page which gives the tips for the different what they can mm -hmm. do, mm -hmm. but I okay. thought it might be something you could talk about. Ruthie, do you, do sure. you need to get a thread yeah. stand so we can show them? So the question is regarding a, a thread stand um, and not fitting in the hole. Uh, Ruthie's going to go grab us a thread stand real quick so we can, we can um, show that. Uh, in the meantime, I know there was a question I think that popped up about uh, a super belt slipping. There's our super belt. Um, and Usually when a super belt slips, it's like Christian was talking about there, it's usually that something else is uh, bound up in the machine. The super belt grips really well and if the machine is nice and free, um, it, will, it will help it run um, much faster, much smoother. Um, but, if it's, um, but if the machine is tough to turn, um, and by, you want to open that up, and by tough to turn I mean uh, I often say when I'm trying to figure out if the machine has varnish or is binding or anything like that, I often take the belt off it and then I turn the hand wheel really fast um, and, and see if that needle will bounce up and down on its own. Uh, that's what it should do when the, the machine is, is nice and loose. Uh, but if the machine uh, is sticky somewhere in the mechanics of it, uh, it can it can cause resistance, and then if the super belt uh, isn't tight enough, it will it will slip on there. But I would first look at what's causing the resistance, mm -hmm. as opposed to just tightening the belt. Mm -hmm. uh, you can tighten the belt by pushing the motor down and and overcoming that usually, but uh, that's usually not um, you're not actually addressing the real issue with the machine. And when it's stiff like that, it's causing the motor and everything to work harder. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would address why that's happening first. So Christian, do you want to uh, talk about the, she specifically was referring to a white featherweight that it mm -hmm. wasn't fitting on. Um, Ruthie, can you maybe go to this overhead camera here so we can show where that, um, where that goes. So the thread stand 
the end of the thread stand is going to go right here in this hole. This is an oiling hole on the machine. And Singer didn't make this hole the same size on every machine. Um, this one here is the perfect size and the thread stand just slides right down in all the way to the uh, plastic stop right here. It's not even loose and wobbly. No, like what, what years do you remember were the ones that they had a really big hole? Some of the earlier featherweights had a um, larger hole than this one on this machine. And then some of some other machines and like the white machines, the hole is gonna be a little bit smaller. So in that instance, the with the hole smaller like this instance on the white machine then when the thread stand goes in it's not going to go in all the way so it's likely not going to sit level or it might not even go in far enough to actually hold um, hold itself up in that scenario what you can do is take the um, end of the thread stand here with some 100 grit sandpaper is what we use yeah yeah or even or it can even be a little bit uh, yeah <laughs> we've actually done it with uh, the nail file and stuff I prefer when Christian and I are teaching classes uh, we have uh, sandpaper and I think it's 100 or 120 mm -hmm. something like that and I just take a, a piece in my hands and I just go around each person's machine and spin this uh, until it until it fits just right um, and that's you know because these aren't uniform that's kind of that's kind of the best way to get it to fit exactly in your machine because you do want it to go down you want it to go down so that it's not uh, floppy around that's the only way that you can really get it uh, to, to to pull straight off of a cone you know mm -hmm. if you have a cone here on the back uh, we used to use these uh, for your upright when when this would be mounted like this we would use those but uh, it was still hard to get this exactly over the top so that it pulled off there without any resistance. Now, for the most part, uh, we just always use the, the thread post instead of the thread stand. But yet, April still does use her thread stand a lot when she's uh, you know, sewing directly off of a cone. You can put a cone in, in your mug here behind your machine and feed it straight off there, and that works, that works too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you already addressed if it's too bit too wobbly. If it is, if it is too wobbly um, on, and there's fortunately, it, it's more common for it to not want to go down there than to be too wobbly. But if you have one of those mid thirties machines where it is uh, a bigger hole, um, a couple things you can do. Uh, you can. I've seen people cut a little circle of, of fabric and and just you know push it over there push it down so that the fabric is, is kind of holding it. Uh, heat shrink tubing in certain cases. It just depends uh, because some of those holes were, seem really big and this thing kind of flops over a little bit. And uh, if it's a bigger hole, electrical tape even mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. Just something to, to make it a little more stiff to go into the, into the hole. Okay, Christian, here's a question for you. This is a really good question. The part number on my penguin singer walking foot is 160739. Mm -hmm. I'm blessed to have two at this number. The box has the number 160741. When the penguin is listed for sale, the number is 160741 is usually used to identify the penguin itself. So my question is, which is the correct way of identification? Okay. Um, the question is, uh, the part number on the penguin walking foot, is this on the foot specifically? Yes. Um, like, it's no different than like the single thread embroidery attachment or any other the okay. attachment where it has multiple parts to it. Okay, so the penguin walking foot on the walking foot itself has the part number, what was it again? 160739. 160739. The box for the walking foot says 160741, right? Mm -hmm. 160741. And the question is why are what is the real part number? What's the difference basically? One six zero seven four one is the number of the walking foot assembled, fully assembled. The bobbin case, the featherweight bobbin case. A lot of people think that the featherweight bobbin case is num is number four five seven five zero. Four five seven five zero is the part number for the bobbin the main portion of the bobbin case base. The fully assembled bobbin case, 
there is no part number stamped anywhere, but in the service manual, you'll see the part number 45751. That's the entire bobbin case. It's just like the penguin. The entire penguin is number 160741. The part that is 160739 is, where's the part number on here? I don't, it might be hidden. It's probably, there. oh yeah, oh yeah, there it is. Is just the looks like the main inside piece. So so here, can you set it over? Set it over here, and Ruthie, put it on this uh, this side camera, if you oh, could. The side room? Yeah. Wait, just a sec. This is the uh, what would you call it? What do they call that? Rare as hen's teeth? Is that the correct uh, correct thing there? This is a penguin walking foot. Uh, it's not called a penguin walking foot officially like from Singer, but when you have it on the machine, it, it's got these little toes here, and when it's, when it's going, it kind of, it looks like it's waddling, like, like a little penguin. And uh, so anyway, these are quite rare, quite collectible, uh, but not only are they collectible uh, for their rarity as a singer item they they work amazingly well and they're all metal and everything and so anyway this is a penguin this is what we were referring to if you ever see one of these at a yard sale or anything like that um that's they go for upwards of two grand now. They, yeah they could have just gone all the way up to about two thousand dollars now it's crazy this little thing's worth more than uh most of uh, most most featherweights actually so anyway. And here's a great example of part number difference. The, if you look, um, to the, map image. the actually the side one, Ruthie's great. Oh, okay. Back? Okay, sorry. The bobbin winder tension unit right here on this machine. This is on the front. Is that the one you want? No, this is the one. Yeah. This is the one. The part number on it yeah. is 45357. Um, that now you can switch to this camera with you. The I'll show it on the, the service map. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that is showing the part number that you see on your bobbin winder tension unit is going to be something like this here, the four five nine three two. That's what's going to be stamped on the unit itself. The number for the entire unit is four five nine three one. You won't see that on the unit you'll see the number that's just the base. The 45931 encompasses all the parts to that unit. So that's, that's what that is. And you'll see, this, you'll see this several places here on, um, on the servicing mat uh, that has the diagram. Uh, with the light switch itself uh, has a, a group of numbers. Even the spool pin has a group of numbers and, and several places down here where um, there's a number that you're not ever going to find stamped on on the machine or on that part, but it is the collection of, mm -hmm. of those parts together. Right. Okay. Next question. My tension dial moves if I accidentally hit it. Is there a way to fix this from not happening? It happens to me all the time. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. The question is that my tension dial moves if I accidentally bump it. Um, the reason is oh, perfect. Um, oh, Ruthie, pull up. Uh, this camera, bit, yeah. this, the side one, yeah. The, the reason why if you just bumped the tension unit, this one's um, relatively stiff, it, I couldn't do it on this machine, but if you just bumped the tension unit and the dial moved, it would be that the post in the center is compressed. You can see how there's that opening there. If it gets... Um, pressed together, then the threads are not going to be pushing out on the uh, on the thumb nut. So if that's the case, you can disassemble the tension unit. We have the video tutorial on the website. And then you can put a screwdriver or um, something flat in here and slightly open that up a little bit. Just, just turn slightly just to open this up a little bit more. And you that's gonna, gonna take a screwdriver and kind of show what you're referring to right yeah. there. So I could stick this screwdriver in here and turn a little bit just to open open that gap up a little bit more. 
and that's going to make the thumb nut a little bit tighter on the post itself. So that would keep the um, keep it from loosening accidentally or tightening if you just bumped the tension unit. Bump it, or sometimes that we've even seen where just ordinary sewing, just the vibration of sewing, all of a sudden your tension will change, and so that that's a pretty easy, good and easy mm -hmm. easy fix on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, two things. Patty from Texas, do you remember Patty? Patty from Texas, yes. okay. She says, if I close my eyes, I would think that Carmen is talking the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was just uh, a, a funny comment that uh, Patty said, if I close my eyes, it seems like Carmen is talking the whole time. And I actually play that, occasionally we play that trick on my mother, um, uh, Christian's grandmother, uh, and she'll, usually it takes a little bit and then she'll say, Wait, who is this? <laughs> yeah, I've talked to somebody on the phone for, I don't know, 10 minutes. They never knew. And I just, I never told them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question is, um, I have a 222 machine that I want to convert. What do I need to do? Ah, good question. So a 222 uh, featherweight that they uh, I'm, uh, want to convert from 220 volt uh, to 110, I'm assuming that's, that's what they mean. Uh, Christian, why don't you explain a little bit of that? So there's a few things that go into converting a machine <coughs> from 220 to 110. And why would it be 220 in the first place? A machine that's can, that's was made in the UK or and then sold in the UK, a country that primarily uses 220 volt electrical current is gonna come with a 220 volt motor, a different plug than here in the US, and a 220 volt light bulb. So if you have a say you bought a 222 or something that was sold in the uk has a 220 volt motor you get it here you can't just plug that machine into the wall you have to do something to get something different to get it to work here because we have just 110 volt going into that 220 machine it's not going to be enough power to often even turn the motor over at all so the first thing you need to do, or the easiest thing, the fastest thing is to just get a converter. You plug the 110 power into the converter and then you plug the machine into the converter so that 220 power is coming out of the converter and then it's gonna work fine. But those converters are often bulky and you don't wanna lug them around. So you can change the motor out from a 110 to a 220 volt. I'm backwards. 220 to 110. 220 to 110. Yep. And um, so you could put a 110 volt motor on there, or you could have the motor rewound. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would need to change the light bulb as well, because now you're going to have 110 power coming in. The 110 power isn't going to be strong enough to light up that 220 volt bulb all the way. So you'll need to put a 110 <coughs> bulb on there. The controller, often people think they need to change the controller out. The controller is compatible with either voltage. You want to make sure there's no capacitors inside, but the controller's fine. The wires inside the machine are fine, but the motor would need changed. The light bulb would need changed, and then of course the plug that goes into the wall wouldn't work. But okay, yeah. so can you let them know that the way that comments are coming in and the way they're being answered, they sometimes will go off my screen, and I can't. I'm trying to go back to the questions. If, okay. So it's if we don't answer them, it's not because we're trying to ignore them. It's just that they go off our screen and I can't go back to them. Right. Uh, April is just mentioning that uh, something changed in Facebook commenting here two, three weeks ago because this is the second time that it's done this. Yeah. Where the comments are coming in uh, so fast and she can't uh, scroll back to them to find mm -hmm. questions. So it's if, like it if just you. Stops it stops scrolling. So if you have a question and it doesn't get answered, uh, I'm, don't, don't feel slighted. It's just part of how the, the comments are rolling through. And of course, if, if, you, if you don't get it answered, definitely call us and, and, or email us uh, and we'll be glad to, uh, to address it. But anyway, that's, that's part of, of what's going on with, uh, with the comments section. Uh, Christian mentioned about um, so on that, did, did we completely finish that? Uh, you, you dealt with uh, changing the light bulb, mm -hmm. changing the motor, mm -hmm. uh, changing the uh, plug on the end of, of the foot controller. Mm -hmm. uh, or, and then uh, you can either 
try to find a 110 volt featherweight motor that still has a lot of life in it, or you can have the 220 rewound down to 110. Um, we are a tiny bit backed up on rewinding motors uh, right now. One of the main <laughs> reasons in that is uh, Burl, who manages our tech department, was in a pretty serious crash, um, bicycle. bicycle crash, a um, couple weeks ago. Spent about 10 days in ICU, uh, was life flighted, had, had to have his aorta repaired, and uh, it was crazy. He's back home now, and he's doing really good. Mm -hmm. I saw him last night. Um, but um, the rest of the technicians were down by one right now, and so we're just a little bit, a um, little bit backed up on motor rewinding. Um, so anyway, but yeah, rewinding a motor is is uh, your best option to basically. It's kind of like having your motor overhauled in your car. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, still an original Singer motor, but it's been got new uh new heart and soul to it now mm -hmm. so okay um david werther sent in a question i can't go back to it right now but i saw it scope on my screen and okay. he was saying that he's finding an a large from if i remember the question correctly a higher frequency of broken terminal receptacles mm -hmm. on 1951 centennial featherweights Okay. Is, are they more fragile, or do you have an opinion on that? Interesting. That would be a, a question for Christian. It was actually a question from uh, David, who we did. Uh, I did the fireside chat with last week. He was saying he was noticing an increased and number. Hopefully, I'm getting the question right. <laughs> and hopefully, David, post again if if this isn't what you actually said. But uh, what April thought you said was that uh, an increased number of the receptacles. Uh, Ruthie, can you flip to the side camera real quick here? This is the receptacle on your featherweight uh, where the cord plugs in uh, and it's Bakelite which is kind of a precursor to plastic. It's pretty brittle and it sticks out just a hair past the bottom edge of the machine. And so often when you go to set the machine down into the case, the case will bump the bottom of that and break out the bottom, <laughs> the bottom of the, uh, the receptacle. We actually find on um, when we're teaching classes, if you're teaching a class of 15, there's a good chance that what, at least two yeah. in there are gonna have the bottom of that broken out. Many times people don't even realize that. So what David was saying is, he seems to notice a, an increased number of those um, on uh, 1951 featherweights. He was wondering if there was any different, Ruthie, uh, <clears throat> the main screen, there you go. It, it could be that the that batch, the Bakelite material wasn't, I don't, I guess, I mean, I don't, it wouldn't be tempered, but whatever, it maybe wasn't, um, might could, not be could, as hard. I, could be flawed. We, I've never yeah. noticed that myself. I haven't, I haven't really um, paid attention, I don't think. To, to the year specifically, because it usually has more to do with um, which case they're going in, especially if you're going in the top tray case that is a narrower case, and so you end up um, mm -hmm. probably getting closer to that edge on that one. That's a good question. Sort of, but with the side tray in there, then you, with the side tray that's, that's always in there, that might be the case, 51, the Centennial started, that's about when they had the case with the side tray, so you do have to put the machine in the case fit. a little bit differently. Might be just because it's harder to get in the case. Uh, it could be. Yeah. Interesting. Well, hopefully that was your question, David. I have... Uh... He says you got it right. <laughs> Do you okay. recommend replacing them, he says. Do we recommend replacing the, um, the receptacle? I do recommend replacing them with um, originals. Uh, unfortunately, the reproductions, um, like many things on the reproductions, the threaded post where the wire nut goes on on the back of that is not as long on the reproduction. Uh, the reproduction is plastic, which is preferable because it's not going to break again the same way. But the issue is on post number three that has both uh, the light wire and the uh, motor wire on it, uh, you put both of those on there with the original eyelet and you don't have enough thread sticking out on that post. So mm -hmm. uh, I do recommend replacing them, but replacing them with uh, originals. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so when winding a bobbin, I loosen the silver knob on the hand wheel, but the needle still goes up and down. Am I doing something right? Okay, oh, yeah, good question. It, the question is, uh, go, go to wind a bobbin, you loosen the uh, stop motion knob, but the needle still goes up and down. Uh, pretty common, and there's, there's an area in here that needs clean. We do have a tutorial uh, on that. Uh, April, could you link that? I will link it, yeah. Yeah, April's going April's gonna to link that. Um, that. That's probably the easiest. Uh, instead of taking this apart right now, she'll link that uh, tutorial. Because there is a fix for it. Because there is, there is a fix, yeah. The first thing I always do, and half the time it takes a problem right away, is just drop the presser foot. That when the presser foot's up, there's nothing against the feed dogs, but when the presser foot's down, the feed dogs, the machine has to work a little bit harder because it has to lift the presser foot up just a little bit when those feed dogs are coming up. So because it's working a tiny bit harder, that usually is enough resistance to then to where then it's just gonna the hand wheel will just free wheel on the collar. It won't have that. Uh, it won't be the machine itself won't be too loose, but um, yeah, the, if yeah. it still does it, then there is another thing that can be done as well. So. Yeah. Yep. Okay, next question. This is our good friend, uh, Sarah Baker. Okay. She says, um, I have, how do you get the super belt from, s how, okay, again, this is not on my screen, so I don't have it here uh -huh. to see. I'm going off memory. How yep. do you get the super belt to stop squeaking like a sixth grade clarinet player? A super belt squeaking like a sixth grade clarinet player. That was a question from Sarah, and that's quite comical. Um, that's what I expect from you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> Uh, Sarah's going on one of our next cruises with us, and so uh, we it will be, I'm sure, many many laughs there. A um, couple things. What, the first thing I would want to check because I've never experienced uh, a super belt um, squeaking or anything like that um, so much as uh, often the squeak is coming from the motor. And so the first thing I would want to do would be to take the belt off, and maybe you've already done that, um, and run it um, without the belt on there and make sure that the squeak's not coming mm -hmm. from the motor. Do you have any other uh, decorn, bits to add? I mean, the cornstarch is going to make it less likely to it does, to make noise. Yeah, it, it's a painted machine, so I don't know if Yeah, uh, and if you're referring to your uh, pretty blue machine there, uh, I have noticed that on... Um, uh, painted machines, there is a difference there because the multiple layers of paint, one of the things about painted machines is they often get way more layers of paint than what was the Japaning process on these black ones. And so therefore there's some places, especially the hand wheel, where you've narrowed that, um, that spot a little bit. And so it's just going to wear and rub in a different way in that mm -hmm. hand wheel. Um, I'm assuming assuming that, but uh, a little belt dressing on there usually takes takes care of that. Um, and by belt dressing, uh, we have commercial s stuff that we use here in the shop, but cornstarch is basically the same thing that will keep it from uh, riding or squeaking in there, so. Um, okay, let's see if I can find another one, because again, this is so crazy how this is doing this. Um, Hold on. What, um, how do you tell if a motor is 110 or 220? And what does the process of rewinding the motor mean? Okay, good question. So the I first question is, how do you tell if a motor is 110 or 220? On the, Ruth, do you want to put this on the side camera? Yep. The motor band here is going to give the motor specs, classification, and series number. But um, yeah, the main thing you can pay attention to is just the voltage should be about in the middle there. This one is 110, 120. Um, you'll see anything from 90, 110, 90, 125. Um, those are all gonna be the 110 class. Um, and then you'll see 190, 210, 200, 220. Um, those are going to be your 220 volt class motors, Ruth. And April's going to grab a, uh, I don't know if she's great, she must be grabbing a 220 uh, motor, but uh, we do have the cutaway 
motor here. You want me to explain some of this, Christian? Oh, the, whoops, the rewinding. On rewinding. Great. Okay, Ruthie, let's uh, let's go. Yeah, back to this this the one side. here, this side one. Okay, so this is our cutaway motor, and um, you've got. Uh, oh yeah. And then I grabbed this one, just so you can show them where it would go. Okay. Okay. Very good. And this is a. It's, I, I don't know what it is. I just grabbed a motor for to demo. Okay. Where, where you would place that sticker. Okay. Okay. So we'll show you that here in a second. So here we go. So we've got this uh, this cutaway motor here. And what you can see there when I turn the pulley, you can see the armature moving around. The armature has all those little copper wires around there, and they are a super fine wire that is, um, there's about, I don't, uh, well, it depends. There's 27 different winding patterns in featherweight motors that uh, we have uh, discovered so far. But there's something close to a thousand feet of, of super fine wire that is that is wrapped around this armature in a certain certain pattern, and that's just how electrical motors work. Um, and what happens? We'll we'll back up to why you might need to rewind one of these in the first place. Is those wires, even though they look like they're just bare copper wires, they're actually they have a coating like a lacquer on them. And if you get oil into your motor that causes it to overheat, it will break down the insulation on those wires. And basically what happens is now you've shortened the circuit that the electricity is running through. And when that electricity uh, or when that insulation is broken down, uh, you've, you've cut down some of your power. So your motor has to work harder and when it works harder, it gets hotter. And the hotter it gets, the more it breaks down the insulation and eventually your motor, motor will start smoking and it will get hot and it will just start losing power and it will die and then it's time to rewind it, which fortunately you can keep the same original housing and rewind it. So that is what uh, they do in the shop is to rewind uh, the armature. But then um, these, and it almost looks like a solid copper wire, if you can point to those, Christian. That is actually the field, and that is uh, made up of that same wire in a, um, a corresponding length of wire to which armature you're using. And um, because you can't just randomly switch armatures out depending on which field you have in there. Um, so when you send a motor in to be rewound, it's going to have a new field in it, and it's going to have a completely new, uh, new wrapped uh, uh, armature, uh, this commutator part over here, which is where your brushes ride on, uh, gets put on a milling machine and gets retrued. Something that uh, actually I don't believe Singer did with these motors back when they were first uh, made. So they actually run a little better because the motors, uh, the brushes are not jumping so much on the commutator. Uh, because it's more true and round. So anyway, that's what it means to rewind a motor. Um, and then uh, April just brought this in here. When we have motors uh, rewound, they get a new badge placed down, down low on the uh, bottom of the motor here, down there like that, that you can see that it says rewound to 110 volts by the featherweight shop. So, uh, the main thing is when people say service a motor, that's completely different than rewinding a motor. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so next question. Um, I was just gonna tell her to stay tuned because um, we're doing a video tutorial on this. What mm -hmm. causes the bobbin winder to stop or skip when running? What causes the bobbin winder to stop or skip um, when running? Um, we do have a uh, tutorial uh, coming out on that uh, here pretty soon, but a couple things. Usually it has to do with the bobbin winder itself being uh, needing lubricated. Uh, it does have an oiling hole right there on the arm. Uh, you probably, I don't know if you can see that from the overhead or, oh, there's a tiny little, Christian, can you point to that hole there with your screwdriver? Little oiling hole right there gets a drop of oil and that should help it spin freely because it, it, it's supposed to spin freely. 
And then uh, it's got washers inside here that may be either loose or smashed and they're not providing that resistance so that when you press it down against the belt, uh, it stays down there on its own. Um, and then of course, if your belt had anything on it, oil or anything like that, you know, it could cause this to uh, not grip on there. And one thing that you can look at to see why it's doing, um, or what exactly skipping or um, jumping means is, is the uh, wheel spinning um, on the belt or is the whole arm bouncing on the belt? If the whole arm's bouncing, then you'll be able to tell that the arm is loose and the washers might need replaced. If the wheel is slipping or spinning, then it's not necessarily the arm, it's likely that the wheel's either too stiff, so you can spin it, make sure that it spins freely, and if, that, if it does, then it's gonna be something um, maybe belt related, it could be bent as well. My machine seems to run fine, but I notice the motor is a bit movable. Is that normal? Uh, the question was, the machine runs fine, but the motor uh, seems a bit movable. More than likely, the motor mount screw is just loose. Ruthie, can you go to the side view for us there? Um, and that is your uh, motor mount screw. Christian, can you show that with the uh, uh, safety screwdriver, which is the one that we actually use uh, to tighten that? Um, so my guess is the motor is just loose. Now occasionally, especially on some of these that are uh, Bakelite housings instead of uh, the metal uh, motor housing, uh, sometimes they, they get broke in shipping um, because it's just held on by that one screw. And right. so sometimes they'll even work even though the mount part is cracked. So yeah. you could look into that as well. And speaking of that, you do want to be very careful um, with those Bakelite motors, uh, there's actually uh, different lengths to motor mount screws, and so they're not necessarily interchangeable. They also come with a little uh, washer that goes on that motor mount screw. So if you put one of the long screws in without the washer and you put it into your Bakelite motor, you can actually crack the Bakelite motor. So uh, make sure you're using the correct, the correct screw mm -hmm. for, for that motor. Yep. How would you tell if it's a Bakelite motor? Um, the yeah, the question, or April was just asking, how do you tell if it's a Bakelite motor? Uh, this one right here would, would be an example of that. Um, the Bakelite ones often have these uh, ventilation slots on the bottom. Um, a metal one does not. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then all on the inside, you'll see the metal ones will be um, silver on the inside. Um, all Bakelite motors are going to have half-inch motor brush caps. That's true. Yeah, that's probably the fastest way to tell the motor cap. If you, here, if you could turn this one towards, because that's got a 3 8 okay. on it. Okay, so Ruthie, yeah, go top right there. The side yep. view. Side view. Side yeah, side. There you go. Perfect. So this motor here is a metal motor with the smaller 3 8 inch cap. This one here is a big light motor and it might be a little bit difficult to see but the cap is indeed quite a bit larger it's got a half inch cap on there which one has a half inch this one down here this is the bake light motor with the half inch cap yeah so your hands okay. covered your hands covered right now you there you go okay okay um what years did the foot controllers have a capacitor? Um, what the question is, what years did the foot controllers have a capacitor? Um, it's not necessarily going to be a question of year on the foot controllers having uh, capacitors. It's more of a question of, um, it depends on where they were made. Um, not every one, and where they were sold, not every one that was made in the UK by any means is going to have capacitors in it, but a lot of them do. Um, and the purpose of the capacitor? The, yeah, the purpose of the capacitors is to cut down on feedback with old uh, tube TVs and radios. So, not it, uh, Christian, he's too, he's too young, but I even remember uh, those days um, when you would turn on the vacuum cleaner in the, in the house and the, the TV screen would just go all fuzzy and, mm -hmm. and, and stuff. But yeah, that's, what, that's the purpose of that was to cut back on that, cut down on that feedback. So not needed by any means today. And 
you can find them on 221 machines as early as like late 1940s and then you can find them on other machines manufactured in the UK through I don't know I'm sure into early 1960 I haven't seen any on the white machines I don't think but um, yeah in the foot controllers in the machine in the motor and it's not necessarily um, what year but where it was made so if you have a machine that was made in the UK that has 220 volt components on it then you want to check for those capacitors in the controller and we do have a tutorial on the website right and the thing is the capacitors um, basically capacitors fail mm -hmm. um, uh, quite regularly it looks like a little almost like probably a lot of times the one in the foot controllers are about the size of would you say like a triple-a battery probably no, not quite as big as a double-a and when those things fail uh, it basically shorts shorts the the uh, foot controller out and the machine will just start running on its own Right. Uh, they're people, wired from one side of the foot controller to the other and then it the capacitors is what basically keeps it from connecting so if they fail the it makes the whole circuit without going through the foot controller just goes straight through so then it would just go ahead yeah yeah okay um back to rewinding a motor how much does that cost um motor motor rewind well the first thing we do um is when you send a motor in um, the first thing we do is to check and see if anything is, um, is first we do a motor service a motor service uh, take it apart replace the brushes replace the wicks um, clean right. it on the inside and if that gets it running again perfectly great if not and it needs a rewind we won't charge you for the motor service they just apply the motor the servicing is, to the rewinding is fee. Is it 149.95 or 159.95? 159.95 is starts. 159.95 is where it starts for the rewind, um, and that's the price of a standard black motor. The other ones, like white and tans, are different. Yeah. They take more effort and, and, and painted featherweights. Yeah. So. yeah, which is another thing, you know, with um, if you're gonna have a machine repainted. Uh, if you found somebody to do that, I would highly recommend that you have the motor rewound uh, first mm -hmm. and then have it painted because what we find is we get a lot of beautiful motors sent to us because the machine's been repainted and now they want the motor to be strong. The issue is they've often, uh, painters often paint over some of the screws and uh, the motor cap screws, uh, the screws that actually hold the motor together and then we have to take that uh, screw out in order to, um, to do that. And you can't do that without chipping the paint if the paint has mm -hmm. been over the top of those, um, uh, those screws. So yeah, I would recommend having your motor rewound first if you're going to have the machine repainted. Okay. Because um, your camera battery is dying. <laughs> I fixed it. Um, okay. Um, so, do you guys do the rewinding, or do you send it out? Oh, that's a good that's a good question. Do we do the rewinding, or do we send it out? So, to give you a little bit of background history, um, years ago, uh, the only person in the world that was rewinding featherweight motors uh, was uh, somebody that was doing it for Graham Forsdyke. Um, who Graham was in London um, at the time. When Graham retired, we went through a period of, what, eight to 10 years with nobody rewinding featherweight motors. And we contacted everybody that we could think of that could rewind motors, you know, from alternator shops to starter shops, to shops that work on small electrical motors. And the issue is it's the amount and the, how fine that wire is. It's just too delicate and tedious for anybody to do it. We found one company in Germany that would rewind motors for 800 and then there was a place in uh, Salt Lake, I believe. No, the Salt Lake place was 800 and in Germany was 300. Still a lot of money to, um, to put into a featherweight motor. Uh, so then Burl, our, our tech manager, he basically reverse engineered, his mind works that way, he reverse engineered 
how these motors are rewound and all the different patterns and everything. And um, it's quite uh, scientific and mathematical how that all works to get to the right voltage and, and the right output and everything. So no, we rewind them here. Um, three different technicians are all trained on the machines to rewind uh, featherweight, um, featherweight motor. So we don't send them out, we do it, uh, we do it right here. And because it's not a commercial operation, uh, it's why there can be a, a couple weeks of uh, uh, downtime on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's kind of, uh, wait, one more question that's come in. This will be the last one because I'm... We'll okay, last question. Um, but what, we still re remind them that we can only see about 20 comments at a time and then they they disappear with the Facebook format. So we'll go back through and answer questions. Right. Um, but we also try to keep the fireside chat more for questions that are not found on the website. Mm -hmm. So if you, if So I don't know if you could hear April uh, mentioning that just regarding questions. She can only see about 20 questions at a time and then when they scroll and they're gone, if she, if she didn't see the question or didn't get it written down, uh, it doesn't get answered. But we try to then once the video fireside chat is over, we go back through and try to answer as best we can or link to tutorials and such as the questions are in there. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're doing the best we can. Uh, the main thing we're trying to do is to answer questions um, that aren't already addressed someplace else. And if they are, we just, we just link to it. So, and sometimes, I mean, there's so many different tutorials and hundred and some videos out there now that sometimes they've been maintained how the brushes have worn inside there, and where I was talking about them jumping on the commutator. You get mm -hmm. some of them that sound more of a clicking sound. Mm -hmm. um, I had an email that I answered this morning from a gal who sent in a video of her her machine. Uh, it happened to be a 301, but she was asking, you know, does this sound normal, and what is this knocking? Um, and so uh, some of those are just really hard to diagnose. I think the first thing I always look at is is the machine sewing correctly first. Right. If it's been serviced and it's sewing correctly, I don't get as, as concerned if it sounds a little bit off. Now, if I can hear a knocking or whatever, then that could be a sign that you know maybe one of the feed dog, feed dog arms underneath the machine is loose or something like that. Um, and so that just takes more and more troubleshooting. But uh, yeah, clicking is not necessarily bad. The, it, uh, the machine often clicks when the loop is pulled through or the threads pulled through. Um, the needle plate, that's not necessarily bad. Um, we can see if it can be helped a little bit, but it, it's not bad. Um, you don't want to have a knocking noise or a grinding noise. Yeah. But um, other than that, belts, different belts can make different noises. The white featherweight's going to make a different noise because it's belt driven on the inside. Mm -hmm. So not every featherweight is going to sound the same. Yeah, but you don't want to hear like knocking noises or grinding noises. Yeah. Clicking this, is common and not bad. Yeah, but. the little take up uh, spring right here on your uh, tension unit, if that's been put on, it's actually supposed to be really loose. If it's been put on and wound up super tight on the spring, you'll get quite a little clicking out of that. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of places that clicks and stuff can come from, but you know, it's a vintage machine and uh, they're, they're made super hardy. And mm -hmm. so uh, usually the, the little oddity of sounds we don't get too worried about, especially when it's, when it's sewing correctly. But like Christian said, grinding and clunking, that type of that type of sounds is where we we definitely want to do some more uh, troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. So, yep. It, okay. Well, that was a uh, fun hour with you all. So, thanks for joining us. You guys have a, a great week and a great June. Thanks a lot. <laughs>